It's great to be with you again today. I hope you are ready to study God's Word together. Today we are going to begin a new book. We will be studying 1 Peter. Now here at Study and Obey, my goal is quite simple. Open the Bible one book at a time, one passage at a time, read it, understand the basic meaning. What does this mean? Uh, and what is the principle that we can learn from it? That's the study part. And then how are we to obey it? What is the application? How can we bring this passage and apply it into practical situations we face in everyday life? That is my goal and that's what we will be doing in this study of First Peter. Uh, now First Peter is a book uh, that is written at a time when persecution was just starting to hit the early Christian church more. Uh, it is likely that the famous Roman fire, which Nero uh, probably started to, and then blamed later on Christians, that this was probably a recent event. And so Nero was looking for an excuse to persecute Christians. And so we know stories where Christians were put like basically skewered and then covered in oil and lit up like live candles throughout the city. A public opinion had been turning against Nero, so he was looking for a scapegoat. He was looking for someone or a group of people to blame. And Christians were the relatively new kids on the block, uh, so to speak. This faith was new and unknown to many Romans, and so some perceived this as a threat to Roman culture. And because of this, persecutions began to start. Uh, and so this is why much of 1 Peter discusses trials and how believers ought to respond to said trials. Now in the passage today, it gets started right off of trials and comparing the trials that we face in life to the eternal inheritance that we have in Christ. So perhaps you believe that you face a lot of trials and you want some encouragement from God's word to help you hang on to that hope and to build up your faith. Then stick around to the end of this video as we study 1 Peter 1, 1 through 9. And I, will be, I believe that you will be encouraged to persevere in the face of trials. Let us read, and we'll read first the uh, first Peter 1, 1 to 2. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, in the sanctification of the Spirit, for obedience to Jesus Christ, and for sprinkling with his blood. Okay, so first of all, this is written by Peter an apostle of Jesus Christ. Peter was one of the 12 apostles, and many times he functioned as their leader. He was a chief leader in the early church. Now, you probably know that Peter denied Jesus three times, but then he was given an opportunity by Jesus to state his love for Christ three times. Peter was a talker. He was often brash and outspoken, but he truly loved the Lord, and he was a leader. He it seems that he was born to be a leader, and he was willing to follow Jesus anywhere. And so this is the letter that he writes to encourage the church, and specifically to encourage uh, believers who are scattered abroad. And these are exiles of the dispersion. So many of those who would have been reading this letter were probably Jews. And he says the elect exiles. I will come back to that point in a moment. But first, we'll jump ahead real quick to 1 Peter 5, 13. She who is at Babylon, who is likewise chosen, sends you greetings. Uh, and so Peter alludes also to some members of the church being in Babylon. Likely this was a code word used for Rome. Again, we talked about the fact that Nero was stepping up persecution of believers. So maybe he uses this code word uh, in order to protect the believers in Rome by not mentioning them directly in his letter. So the readers would have been the ones scattered all around um, in all of these provinces and perhaps in Rome itself. And it's written <clears throat> to them, these were like aliens. 
they were believers who'd been uprooted either to share the gospel or to escape persecution. And so we should remember that as, as they were, so we too are aliens in this world. And sometimes God uses that. In fact, at that time, the early church was gathered largely in one place in Jerusalem. They were supposed to go to the ends of the earth as witnesses, but they weren't doing it yet. And so God sent along some persecution and then kind of like fanned a few flames under them to uh, light a spark. And then they moved to other locations and they started to share. So because there's believers in all of these different places in the Roman Empire, then the gospel could actually spread much more quickly. But we should remember that this world is not our home. Now Peter mentions that these are elect. Uh, this is one place in the Bible that supports this doctrine of election, so to speak. And Ephesians 1 talks about that more. It says, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. And so that is what election is. It means that God, in his sovereign grace, looks out at this world of people who do not deserve him. They're not acting in a good way. They're not loving him. And then he, he calls us and he chooses us and he saves us. And so it's a reminder that we love because he first loved us. Let me try to type that in there. First John 4, 19. We love because he first loved us. So he chose us. He loved us. And he did that long before we chose him, long before we were believers. And so Romans 3, 10 through 12 teaches that we are not good. We are sinners, each and every one of us. We need God to first reach out in his initiative and show his love to us and his mercy to us before we can respond to it. So when we come to the Lord, we are bringing nothing. Uh, we are not bringing our good deeds. We are not bringing our righteousness. We are responding because of what he has done in our hearts and because of his election and his choice of us. Now, that doesn't mean that we are not responsible for the choices that we make. Scripture teaches both. God is sovereign and we are responsible at the same time. No one can blame God if they themselves do not repent and turn to him. So this is uh, actually a very comforting doctrine. God chooses us, not because we are good. In verse 2 it says, according to the foreknowledge of God, which doesn't mean, oh, he looks forward in time and he sees that you will believe and so your belief is then um, you know, guaranteed to happen. But even looking forward, knowing everything he know, th there is to know about you, looking at all of the sins and all of the things you will do, he says, I still want you and I still choose you. And that's encouraging because if he chose you, even when you are a sinner and knowing you would do those sins, then that also means he won't reject or abandon you. He won't change his mind because of discovering something else later on. A lot of couples make a vow, I will love you forever until death do us part, and then they get married, and then they say, whoa, I did not know you were like this. Or they might say, oh, you have changed. Well, and then, and then they get divorced, some of them, and they don't go through with their commitment. But God isn't like that. He knows everything about you, and he still says, I want you, and he still sent his son to die for you, and he still saves you. And so because he saved you knowing who you are, he's not going to cast you out when you continue to do those things later on. Again, this does not absolve us of personal responsibility. We have to place our faith in him. We have to repent of our sins. We have to confess. We have to do all those things which he calls us to do. But we remember that God is sovereign and that he loved us first, even when we were unlovable. What a gracious God. What a kind God we have. Praise the Lord. In the latter part of verse 2, we see all three members of the Trinity involved. It says, the Father and sanctification of the Spirit for obedience to Jesus Christ. The Father chooses us. The Spirit sanctifies us. Christ redeems us with the sprinkling of his blood. So all three members of the Trinity involved in salvation. And so 1 Peter starts off largely with salvation because it's going to be about trials and about persecution. But he wants to start off with the foundation that you are saved, that you have an inheritance. And so this should give you hope and encouragement in those times of trial. So let's come forward and read verses 3 through 9. 
Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Okay, so this is jam-packed with rich theology about the gospel and salvation and faith and our inheritance and so many things. So if you're going through trials, then just stay tuned because this passage well has so much in it that can encourage you and help us to count our blessings so we don't focus on the trials and the difficult things but we come back to the rock solid truth of god's love for us so let's go through these verses and we will unpack some of it there's so much here that i cannot hit on all of it in a short video but we will hit on some of the points now so first i want to bring out his mercy it says according to his great mercy. This is one of the themes we can see throughout this passage. He chose us. He redeemed us. He saved us. He gives us an inheritance. You can see a sister passage very similar in Ephesians chapter 1. It lists many of the same blessings that God has in store for his believers. None of these are deserved. Think about your life. Think about what you have either your marriage or your children or your home or your career or your health, of course, your salvation, all of these things, which of these things do you deserve? In fact, we do not deserve them. Sometimes my children might complain about something being, it's not fair. If you have children, you've probably heard this phrase before, it's not fair. And I often tell them, well, that's a good, it's a good thing that God's not fair with us, isn't it? Because if God was fair with us, then that means we have to pay the penalty for our own sins ourselves. God wasn't fair with us. He was merciful to us. Jesus dying on the cross isn't fair. They weren't his sins. He didn't have to do it. That was mercy, that he took those sins onto himself so you don't have to. That's the greatest trade you can ever make. You give him your rubbish. You give him a trash can filled with sins and wickedness and he dumps it onto himself and he instead gives you eternal life, forgiveness, sanctification, and all of these things. What's fair about it? It's nothing about fair. It's about mercy. Thank God that he is merciful to us. Well, when we when we face trials, and again, First Peter is a lot about trials, then it helps us to come back to the truth. God is merciful. We might say, oh, the trial's not fair and I don't deserve this. Actually, we deserve a lot worse. So we should remember during these times, God has been merciful to us. So this should give us a spirit of thanksgiving and actually faith to come back to the truth. Even in the trial, remember all the mercy that God has shown you. And it could be a lot worse if you were actually receiving what you deserve. So thank goodness that God is not fair. And at the same time, we need to show mercy to others because he's given mercy to us. We need to give mercy to others. He, we are to be followers of Jesus. What Jesus does, that's what we are to do. He's merciful. We should be too. So is there someone in your life that you need to show mercy to? That could be an application from this passage to go and show that person mercy because Jesus has shown us mercy. Now let's come forward. It says, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope. So again, salvation is because of him, not because of us. And it says, a living hope. Our hope is placed in Christ, and he is alive. Think about how the disciples would have felt. They followed Jesus for three years. They saw his miracles. He fed the 5,000. He walked on water. He calmed the storm. He healed countless people. He raised people from the dead. They saw all of these things, 
and then their leader is taken away from them and killed. And they don't even really get to say goodbye. And so there they are in their room, gathered together, surely desperate, surely lonely, sad, all of those emotions that they would have. And, well, they don't have any hope. Everything that they believed in, everything that they followed was taken away. And it seems that their dreams and their hopes were crushed. And then Jesus himself, alive, comes into the room. And he, and he tells Thomas, you can touch my hands and you can touch my side. And he appears to all of them. And so, boom, living hope. Everything that he taught, everything that he represented, it's still true. They can still place their hope in it. It's, in fact, more firm and more sure than ever before. It's a living hope because Christ is alive. Now, our hope should not be set on anything in this world. Many people put their hope in money, in the size of their bank account, uh, or in their life insurance, or their social security, or all of these things, their IRAs. Not a living hope. These things can be taken away in an instant. And we saw in 2008 with the Great uh, Recession, boom, they can be gone just like that. Some people place their faith in politics, in this or that politician, and think if we, he can just get elected, then he will change everything for good. It's, it's not a living hope. These people cannot really save. Some people place their uh, hope in luck or fate or the lottery. All kinds of things people place their hope in, and these things will disappoint. Now, our hope, notice again, it's not, our hope is not on heaven. I hope that when people say, what's your hope? It's not heaven or eternal life, or a guardian angel. Our hope is in someone, and that someone is Jesus who rose again from the dead. We have a living hope. Now, in some movies I've seen, the heroes like to make a promise to their kids or to their wife. They're about to embark on some dangerous journey, uh, maybe the most dangerous journey in the history of the world, probably, <clears throat> and they say, don't worry. I will be back for you. Everything will be okay. Now, in the movie, sometimes it happens. Sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes the kids are disappointed. But in real life, those who rely on such people or such promises are bound to be disappointed sooner or later. But Christ, he did the impossible. He rose again from the dead. Now, if he could defeat death, what can he not do? Nothing is impossible for him aside from sinning, of course. So put your hope in him. You won't be disappointed. Now, when people put their hope in something, there are two possible outcomes. Two. One is they don't get what they hope for, and so they will be disappointed. Maybe they hope for a car. They don't get it. They're disappointed and they feel empty. The second is you get what you hope for and then you are still disappointed because it doesn't bring the happiness that you expect. You can probably think back on your life and think about both scenarios. Sometimes when you set your hope on something, a relationship or a career, and it didn't happen, maybe you were devastated. Or other times you set your hope on something and you did get it and then still you were disappointed afterwards because it wasn't enough. We might get a gadget or a new toy or things that we like and we feel so excited about it and for a week or two we, we spend time with it and we play it and we mess with it and we enjoy it and then after that the excitement wanes. That is what happens when we place our hope in this world. We are to set our hope on Christ because he alone satisfies. He will not disappoint you. He is a living hope. What is the hope? Well, first, it's through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So Jesus arose, so everything he said is true, and he will do what he promised. And he promises an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading. When you place your faith in things in this world like materials, you may get a lot of it. But the happiness they bring is temporary, and they themselves are temporary. Now, some time ago, there was an internet company called MySpace. If you're old as me, then you probably remember MySpace was Facebook before Facebook was Facebook. And MySpace was the place to be on the internet. And the owner of MySpace was offered $2 billion for his company. And he declined that offer 
That was right before Facebook debuted. And soon, MySpace was totally ir irrelevant, faded into obscurity, and I don't know what happened to him, but he didn't get the golden egg that he could have gotten that would have made his family and all of his descendants rich. It vanished. And so sometimes riches fade really, really quickly. My grandfather uh, worked hard. He wasn't a rich man, but he worked hard and he saved money his whole life. And through some kind of a scam that was not his fault, almost overnight, then a lot of this was gone. And so this happens. It happens frequently, way too frequently. But even if it doesn't happen to you, the longest the riches can last is until death. Jesus talked about the parable of the rich fool who made more and more things, more and more money, stored up more and more materials, and he was looking at all his vast empire of stuff which he'd collected, and he, his heart was very satisfied with himself, and he thought, wow, I've really made it. I've really done well. And God looked down and says, you fool, because he's, his destiny uh, was to die that evening. And he could not take a single cent with him into the, the next life that would come. So, an inheritance. Many people work so hard for an inheritance that fades away. But our inheritance is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading. In simple, it is eternal. What is our inheritance? It is righteousness and joy. Uh, peace, perfection, God's presence. It is being a companion with the Lord forever. It is the rewards that he's given to us. It is forgiveness of sins. It is a, a new body, an upgraded version of, of me, Jason 2.0, or you in heaven. And everything else God has planned, everything that God has in store for you, that is your inheritance. In short, paradise. And not just heaven, but it's being with Christ there Heaven is heaven, not because it's heaven, but because Christ is there. That's where we will be with him forever. Now in the world, when someone has an inheritance like this, he can become quite lazy. Think of the prodigal son. He asked his father for the money. The father gave him the money, and so he went off and he squandered it all. That happens in real life all the time. But for a believer, having an inheritance should not make us lazy. In fact, it's the opposite. The your inheritance will grow as you work more in this world. In the book of Matthew, it says we cannot serve two masters. We cannot love treasure on earth and treasure in heaven, but we should work for the treasure that is in heaven. So when you work for God now, it's actually increasing your heavenly inheritance later on. God will reward you for the work that you do for him. So set your heart on the heavenly things, not on the earthly things. So again, when you face trials, remember that you have an inheritance. You have an unfading, eternal inheritance that no one and nothing can take away from you. All right, moving forward, verse 5, who by God's power are being guarded. This ties back to the fact that we have a living hope. Our inheritance, our souls are protected by Christ. You can imagine his hands as the first unbreakable safe that has ever been made. He holds us in his hands. Nothing can take us out of his hands. That's a promise in John chapter 10. And then it talks about a salvation ready to be revealed. Now, this verse can be a little bit confusing. What does it mean a salvation ready to be revealed? Aren't we saved <clears throat> right now? John 3.36, for example, says, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. That's right now. John 5.24 says, I say to you, whoever hears my words and believes him who sent me has eternal life. Present tense. Both of these are present tense. So then what does this mean? A salvation ready to be revealed. Well, some theologians put it like this. They say it's an already but not yet reality. We are saved right now. Our sins have been forgiven right now, but we don't yet see the full effects of this salvation in our life. We are still trapped in this sinful, fading body. We still sin. We have not yet seen Christ. One day we receive new bodies. We won't sin. We will see Christ. We will actually be living in the mansions he prepares for us. 
So again, already, but not yet. We already have eternal life, but we have not yet um, tangibly and physically received all aspects of that, even though it is guaranteed and certain. Um, now, I don't know about for you, but for me, this illustration helps. I think of it as an inheritance in trust. When someone passes away, they leave their child the estate in trust. That estate fully belongs to that child, let's say a five-year-old child, but they cannot get it yet. They still have to grow up and to mature before they can receive that whole estate. Now, maybe they're getting paid every year for however long until they become of age. Now, at some point when they are old enough, the limitations are removed and then they control all the assets of the estate. This is much like our heavenly inheritance. It belongs to us, but it is in trust. So on this earth, we receive part, some kind of down payment. When we meet God face to face, we will receive the rest. So that's kind of how I understand this already, but not yet. It's ours, but we haven't yet fully received it yet. How should this affect us? Verse 6, and this is really a key application for this passage. In this, you rejoice. So simply put, rejoice. When you face trials, rejoice. Peter was writing to believers, many of whom were persecuted. The world was turning against them, their friends or relatives, government, neighbors might have been turning against them. They didn't seem to have a lot to rejoice about. But Peter reminds them that the trials you face are temporary and joy is not to depend on circumstances. You can rejoice in your eternal life, in your salvation, in your unfading inheritance, even when you face trials. So, rejoice. I love how Habakkuk puts this. <clears throat> Habakkuk 3.17 Though the fig tree should not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, the produce of the olive fail, and the fields yield no fruit, f food. The flock be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. God the Lord is my strength. Okay. If total disaster strikes, the refrigerator is empty, no money in the bank account, you have debt and no way to pay the bills and no food to eat, still, I will rejoice. Rejoicing is a decision and it's a decision based on the truth that you know about the spiritual blessings that you have. Okay, moving forward. Trials. It says, though now for a little while, if necessary, you've been grieved by various trials. These trials serve a purpose. It says, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So trials serve a purpose. Throughout the Bible, we see trials are meant to increase our faith. They are meant to, to test your faith and to confirm the faith that you have and to build it up. They make you more dependent on God and more heavenly focused, while at the same time, they help you to realize where your weaknesses are and to depend more on God's strength. Now, a few people will say, oh, last year was the smoothest year of my life. It was so easy and so smooth every day, and I grew a lot. You normally will hear people say it was a very difficult year, and I grew a lot, because growth often happens through difficulty. Now, for you, if you're a parent like me, then you know that sometimes you allow your kids, perhaps, to struggle with something, um, either through a form of exercise or working through some of their homework or problems or tasks that are difficult for them, and you let them go through it, even though you could step in and do it for them or tell them, okay, you don't need to exercise or whatever it is. You could step in and prevent them from going through that, but you know that that thing is good for them. You might have a child who doesn't like to exercise. You could say, it's okay, you don't need to exercise. But then you might see that child gain weight and be unhealthy. And so you say, you need to exercise. And so I think for God and us, it's a little bit similar. God could keep us from going through any trials, but he knows that we need those trials in order to grow. 
so he lets us go through them. They serve a purpose. And hopefully, when we come through it, they, these we are tested by fire, okay? And the faith is proved genuine. Then finally, we can praise and glorify and honor the Lord. That is the goal. Okay, so moving forward in this passage, we see some applications in the last few verses. It says, though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him. And then you rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory. So three things, love him, believe in him, and rejoice. These are three responses that we can have in the middle of trials. You say, oh, I don't see God and the trial's right here in front of me. You can make the choice. I love him and I believe in him. I believe in the truth of his word. I believe in what he's promised. I believe in the unfading inheritance to come. I believe in God's goodness for me. And then when you can love him and when you can believe in him, then you can also rejoice not just with an ordinary mundane joy but it says rejoice with joy that is inexpressible when someone looks at a believer who's going through such difficult trials and sees them rejoicing and that doesn't mean oh i'm happy that something bad has happened but it's a deep inner peace filling their hearts because they rest in the lord and they trust in the lord that is such an encouraging thing and such a powerful testimony and then, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Our relationship with God does require faith. When we face trials, we may not understand the reason that God is allowing them to happen. We have not yet even seen God. We haven't seen God face to face, and yet we believe in Him. Let's look at a verse in Matthew thirteen sixteen. Blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. So some have seen and some have heard directly, and they believe, and that's blessed. But it's even more so when someone who hasn't yet seen. John 20, 26, uh, about Thomas, John 20, 29, Jesus said to him, that's Thomas, have you believed because you've seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. So when you choose to have faith in the Lord, even in the midst of a trial, when you're not actively seeing him at that moment in time, then it says you are blessed. And what is the reward? What is the result of this faith? It says the result is the salvation of your souls. That's the greatest reward, reward that anyone can have. Our souls will be saved. You can have complete joy throughout your entire life because you know, you know that God is true. You can have absolute confidence in his promises. So when you are facing trials, remember these truths. Remember that he is your living hope. Put your faith in him, the living hope. Don't place your faith or hope in anything in this world, whether money or you know, worldly security or insurance or people. Place your faith in him because he's alive. He has your best interest at heart and he is holding in his unbreakable hands your eternal security. So let's examine our heart, examine our life. Consider, are you facing trials these days? And what has been your response to those trials? Come back to the truth, the truth of God's mercy and his grace and his love for you. And let that encourage you and fill you with a heart of thanksgiving that even in the midst of a trial, you'll be able to say, praise be to him because he is good. And that you will be able to count your blessings one by one and therefore to be filled with rejoicing. I hope this passage encourages you, and I hope to see you next time. We'll continue our study through 1 Peter. God bless. See you then.